Welcome to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I am Dr. Anna Wasesha, President of Middlesex Community College, and joining me today is Ann Cassidy. Ann was a faculty member here at the college for a long, long time, but I've just met her in the last few months as I've joined this new college. Uh, new to me, as you all remember, I moved here from Minnesota just at the end of uh, June. So I think as I was driving in this morning, I was thinking, well, I'm getting close to my three-month anniversary at Middlesex. So I met Ann because she's a member of our foundation board, and she's introduced me to the local chapter of the American Association of University Women, AAUW, and I know she's going to be acting in a play. So I thought today what we would talk about, since she'd be such a wonderful resource in, the, in this area, is this question of whether or not college prepares you for retirement. I know that uh, as we worry about the unemployment rates in this country and we talk about our concern that uh, Americans need a college education in order to be productive in the workforce, uh, we're responding to very practical needs that we all know exist to put a roof over our heads, to raise our families, to contribute to our communities. But, you know, as uh, we age, and I'm certainly aging, we're all aging every day, uh, we have to realize that uh, many Americans are living long into retirement. So my question to Anne is going to be, did college prepare you for retirement? Yes, because, because my interests in college, my own particular story here, were writing and theater and working with groups of people who could benefit from your extra attention. And so when I uh, retired from Middlesex after 30-some years of teaching full-time uh, as an English professor, I, one of the first things I wanted to do was c carry on with my love of writing, always my interest in, in, as a student and as, a, as an, an instructor. So I uh, voluntarily jumped into the community and offered a, a writing memo, mem memoir writing course which was a great thing to do the first semester when you've left the exciting life of a college campus and uh, you're trying to fill your suddenly wide open life with new experiences. And then I carried on my love of theater, which I began practicing at Wesleyan as a graduate student in the 60s and then carried on through Middlesex as I uh, directed several, maybe 12, theatrical productions here on campus, even though we don't have our own theater, we do have some interesting spaces here at Middlesex, wherein one can create uh, one's own theater in the round, so to speak, and we've done that, uh, we did that successfully a number of times over my 30 years. So I'm carrying on my interest in, in theater in the local community. I'm very happy that uh, a friend of mine in the local community, Dick Wheeler, has joined our faculty here at Middlesex and in, in a very capable creative way is carrying on theater here at uh, on the campus. I know that um, as we we have to take a break in just a moment but when we come back I'm, I'm gonna ask Anne about memoir writing because that's really getting more and more um, uh, into the public arena. I think people are even young people are writing memoirs so let's talk about that when we get back to the Welcome back. Uh, with me today is Ann Cassidy. Uh, she was a professor of English here at the college, Middlesex Community College, for decades, and now she's recently retired. And what we're talking about is, does college prepare you for retirement? I was just saying that she immediately went from teaching uh, as a professor to teaching a memoir writing course. So can you, and first of all, did you do that through Mile, or where did you do the teaching? That particular writing course, I offered at the library in my town in Durham, Connecticut. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So tell us about memoir writing. What's involved? Memoir writing, everyone has a story to tell, and that's what I called my course. Right. What you find in a course that you offer to uh, freely to members in a community is that you get all kinds of writers and non-writers, yeah. <laughs> readers and non-readers, just as I did in my middle sex classes, which makes it always an interesting experience. And so there isn't any one answer because every single individual student, writer, no matter what the age, had her or his own story to tell and in terms of their level of reading, interest in writing, capabilities, life experiences, basic skills. So the important thing for me was to give everybody help to build their confidence in knowing that they each person did indeed have a story to tell. And it was wonderful, and each 
class because students would come in with uh, reading each week and share a part of what they wanted to. We usually off, uh, I assign themes and people and some people would take off from the assigned theme and, and find their own subject matter to write about. What kind of themes? Oh my, let me try to remember. Uh, we had themes about our youth. Now you're going to put me on the spot. Mm. Because this was about seven years ago. It was one of the first activities I took on as a new uh, retired member of the community. We talked about embarrassing situations. Many people were dealing with experiences of death in the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was an important subject to to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people went on to put together all of these short little vignettes and chapters into a larger work mm -hmm. that was a wonderful thing to see, watch happen as they left the course. And others perhaps wanted to stay with the one story, a woman about the loss of her daughter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard for a parent to live on having lost a child, and that was a very big subject for her, and she stayed with that the whole, the whole time. Right, right. So, so who's the uh, audience for a memoir then? I mean, it sounds to a certain degree like oneself is the audience for a memoir. Many of the students, from in my experiences, were writing for their families, yes. Uh -huh. They wanted to, especially in the senior class, the seniors wanted to write and leave a, a kind of a legacy of stories behind for their grandchildren mm -hmm. and talking about the building of a house, talking about family an ancestry, wonderful family characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I'm now my mind is returning to those days, there were some wonderful stories that oh, came out of, and they didn't really have anything to do with my assignments. You know, you sort of sure. try to give people a direction and other people would just take off. Right. Where, where their memories take them. Right. So it's it's a wonderful exercise for anyone, and it's a wonderful uh, thing to be able to to do is to write down your tell your stories. Sure. Do you think reading makes you a good writer? Yes. Yes. Did you find that they were, were reading? Did you give them examples of other people's? Yes, I often memories? brought in um, excerpts from that I thought might be uh, enticing to them and motivate. But you know, we I, we just we just passed the uh, anniversary of 9/11, and there was this remarkable story in the Hartford Current about what we remember. And I, as I recall, we, most actually we don't remember very much of what happened, but what we do remember is the story we tell ourselves about what happened. So we might not, if we were asked to witness to something, to come in and to say this is what we actually saw at what time. Uh, what what events occurred? We might not actually be the best um, in remembering that, but but almost everyone remembers very clearly in their own mind what happened and where they were on 9/11. Mm -hmm. And I would think with memoir writing, you might have there, there's that mixture of, you know, actual events and mm -hmm. people in their mm -hmm. past, and then there's that story that evolves that we tell ourselves. About. Absolutely, and yeah. I think that's understood. I think it's yes. understood by the audience, and I think. Right. Uh, Joan Didion talked about that way way back when my first favorite writers mm. and how uh, things were as she remembered them mm. whether that was mm. um, someone would have been someone else's uh, perspective or memory it didn't matter this was her her reality the way she would remember something or embellish mm. at times so who were your favorite writers when you were young she was one of them yeah sounds and, like it. Uh, uh, in teaching, I loved uh, Flannery O'Connor. I just loved the depth and the drama of Flannery O'Connor and her bizarre characters. She still remains one of my favorite writers. Right, and she actually, she herself personally has an amazing story, doesn't she? Yes, yes. yes. In her short life, she, yes. she had an amazing story to tell. So many of these women with short lives. I can think about uh, Sylvia Plath, for example. Um, who uh, did not live long but made a huge impression on so many mm -hmm. young writers and certainly young readers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was difficult for many of my students to take, though. <laughs> Some were very angry poems. Yes. You know, she had a lot, of, a lot to say. What about you, President? <laughs> <laughs> who are some of my favorite, favorite writers? writers? Oh, see, now you've put me on the spot. Uh, well, um, 
I, th I think there are actually kind of two divisions of reading. There's the kind of reading that is like uh, eating dessert and candy, and I'm, a, I'm an avid mystery reader. But I also really love language and poetry, and so, of course, I think most of my uh, collection of uh, new friends here on the campus knows that I love William Shakespeare, which, you know, um, it, it sounds a little strange, I suppose, but I, I love his story. I, I marvel at anyone's ability to write uh, even one really good play, and Shakespeare wrote so many really good plays way, way, way before we had uh, electronic uh, uh, instruments like computers to help us, you know, with quill and, and paper and short <laughs> supply and, uh, and all those. And, and I think what it is about it is this ability to have a window into the human soul, you know, to, to really be able to understand us as human beings, mm -hmm. which is why I'm a humanities person, I guess, mm -hmm. even though my academic background in graduate school was social science, but I was always being uh, pilloried in class for being too much of a humanist. You know, you care too much about the actual human right. beings and all this, not just the giant uh, aggregated numbers, the 90% of this and the 47% mm -hmm. of that. Of course, coming from Minnesota, there's a long tradition of really great writers um, like Fitzgerald you know, wrote some phenomenal stories, you know, with Great Gatsby about about the kind of evolution of American society in the early 20th century and, and the rich and the poor. He did a great job of describing that cultural time, you know, the Jazz Age. And all the way to the modern sort of Robert Bly group, the poets. Mm. Uh, there's a really strong mm. uh, stream mm. of writers, yeah, who, who live and work in Minnesota. And as you were remembering, I'm thinking T.C. Boyle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. powerful amazing writer, mm -hmm. and um, Russell, Bank, uh, Ru Ru Russell Banks. I loved his short stories. Is that the right name? No, Russell Banks is a Native American person, Native American leader. Yeah, mm, Russell Means, Russell Banks. No, this is, oh. Now, this. here, you know, oh, here, okay, oh, so here we are. I have the wrong name. Um, but isn't Russell, this, Russell, oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's all right, because what we're talking about is memoirs, right? And, so, <laughs> and memory. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Here we are. Well, what about volunteerism in general? Let me switch the subject from what you and I can remember and can't remember about our favorite writers. And let's talk about the groups that you found have been the most exciting for you to join as a volunteer. And, you know, let, can I just pause to say that someone said to me when I was in my early 20s, you know, the only difference between volunteer work and, and professional work is that you're being paid to do professional work. But volunteer work is incredibly valuable to society. We just don't immediately, at the, at the present time, we just don't pay for it. Sometimes volunteer work becomes so important that we do find ways to pay for it. And there's this evolution of fields. And, that's, and when you think about women, this caring for children, caring for the sick, was often, you know, back mm -hmm. in the 1700s mm -hmm. and the 1800s, that evolved out of volunteerism into professional paid work. So I just want to say that because I'm a strong proponent of volunteerism, and I think sometimes people think it's not as serious as real work. I'd like to hear what you think about that. Well, volunteerism that. is a big part of my life today. That really relates back to your original question about how college prepares you for your afterlife as a retired <laughs> person. Because I, from my family and through my college experiences and through my teaching experience on a college campus for over 30 years, I see the real value in teaching our students civic responsibility and being involved citizens and being informed citizens and being out there. I, I ran the service learning, the very small uh, corner of the college. We offered service learning. We brought that into the college and uh, I was the contact person for the students out there doing their, their projects and right. in, in the in the community, and that was wonderful. That was one opportunity for me to listen to these students and the choices they made. CVH, hospital, working with young people, all kinds of wonderful adventures right. they came up with on their own for right. the three credits of service learning. So, but that's all been a kind of a part of my family background and my um, the value of, of being involved in your community and giving back. And so now, partly why I retired early from a job that I miss greatly and loved dearly was so that I would have time beyond my, I need to grade those papers, or I should be grading those papers, or I am reading and rereading those papers, to having the time to be outside, out there in the community. And so now I've, uh, my husband just retired and he's watching me go in my day, and he said, well, uh, uh, do you ever stay home for a day? Right, right. And so uh, yeah. I, I'm very involved in um, Durham, in the town of Durham and mostly in the town of Middletown and 
in on some boards and some volunteer visits to the elderly and uh that's right. That's right. You told me about that last time we met, and we're going to talk about that some more right after this break. <laughs> Welcome back to Middlesex Moments. I'm Dr. Anna Wasesha, and with me today is Ann Cassidy, a retired professor of English here at Middlesex Community College, and we're talking about the past and how it prepares us for the future. That is to say, does college help us prepare for retirement? Right before the break, we were talking about volunteerism and all of the organizations that you've been working with and what you've been doing with your time. So, Anne, let's let's hear some more about how you dedicate all these hours that you used to dedicate to these uh, the students here on campus in classes. Well, I admit that I think the first year took me a while. I, I continued to teach as an adjunct here at Middlesex for a, a semester or two. But that was so strange to come back as an adjunct after having been so terribly fully involved as a, as a full-timer and then decided to let that move on so that um, the younger people who were desperately looking for work could take over. I, one of the first jobs I took on was a volunteer uh, work with the local St. Luke's Elder Care here in Middletown. Uh, and I was driving people to their individuals to their uh, doctor's appointments, medical appointments and did that for, for a while and then decided I would rather visit the elder. I was too upset with the medical system <laughs> the more I learned. Mm. And I said, perhaps I should do something else. So I am now visiting, uh, now for the third year, uh, I visit for a day every week uh, an, uh, one, a 101-year-old woman through St. Luke's Elder Care Services who lives alone in Middletown. And do you hear some remarkable it's, stories? It's very I would lonely. Think. and. Uh, tells me the same remarkable stories <laughs> over and over and over. And I often think I should sit, stay home one day and write these, de- write these stories down for her. Mm-hmm. So that's one um, wonderful, important afternoon I spend a week. But mm-hmm. uh, I did join the um, Wadsworth Mansion, uh, the Friends of Long Hill. I was asked to join their music committee, so I co-chair the wonderful jewel of Middletown, the Wadsworth Mansion at Long Hills Estates. Totally run voluntarily, that beautiful old estate built around the turn of the century and re- restored about uh, 12 years ago, I believe, by the city of Middletown. Mm-hmm. And it is, a self, it is a self-sustaining building, an entity. Uh, Middletown pays for a, an executive director and her assistant, and then it has long the Long Hill Authority, which oversees primarily the exterior issues around the building and the Friends of Long Hill, who take care of much of the interior work. And we also provide for the community of Middletown and the larger environment around, the larger community, um, free free events throughout the uh, year. That's part of our mission, to share this wonderful facility with other people, Uh, and I'm particularly involved with a summer concert series where we give four free open-air concerts to anyone who would love to come and join us on the lawn, on the south lawn through the uh, the month of July. So all kinds of wonderful and interesting events and activities going on right here in Middletown, Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's still where my heart is. Did you study music in college? No. So, so how is it that you were theater. drawn? Theater, theater, that's right. Oh, I'm married to a musician, oh. and so I know a lot about a number of Music. bands, and so I think I was pulled in. Yes. And of course, they make their, their main livelihood through weddings, beautiful weddings mm-hmm. at that, on that lovely estate. Yeah, the grounds are phenomenal. I've, you know, I've, I've seen it yeah. once, and yeah. I've got a, I, yeah. I'm looking forward to going to the concerts next right. summer. Right. But it was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, right? So the... The, the grounds themselves are um, almost, a, well, they're these deliberate collections of trees mm-hmm. that are native to yes. Connecticut. And yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is a jewel. You're right. It Absolutely. Is. Yeah. So tell me about what other things you do. Well, there's theater. There's a wonderful theater uh, playwriting group I joined, uh, the uh, Floating Theater a Company. Playwriting group. Playwriting group. Oh. And, uh, well, it's... There are some very fine, fine writers who come from New Haven and Hartford uh, and or reside in Middletown or this more local area who are all 
writing and publishing and having produced uh, their plays, yes. Mm -hmm. We have a real uh, a writing community of all kinds, but this is, this is focusing on the theater. Are so you I joined that group, and I did write, uh, I completed, I am working uh, very part-time on a, on a full-length play. That's a real challenge. I did complete my first uh, one-act one play called Meat. It's about the meatpacking industry in the Midwest and the problem with methamphetamine uh, use, the yes, growing problem. Yes. Mm, it's a huge for the, problem. For the exploited workers who need to, who are paid less and asked to work right. longer and very difficult, uh, con under very difficult conditions. And the problem with, you know, the attraction of methamphetamine to keep them going, it's a, it's a big, it's a big, terrible story. And it's so real. And it's a problem that's not going away. I started reading about that, and it just uh, made me want to try to uh, reveal some of those harsh realities. And uh, so I, I'm feel, I, sometimes I think I should just make that into a full-length play because it, it has a power, some powerful uh, revelations to uh, it dramatizes. That's a remarkable story. Yes. Well, tell me some more about that play. Have you? Has it been acted? Have you had anybody we did, read we, it through? Or the Floating Theater Company does. Uh -huh. uh, do a showcase, uh -huh. offer a showcase once a year. Each of the playwrights chooses a short piece or a, a, a part of a longer piece to a uh, longer play to mm -hmm. um, have read. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And um, so interested playwrights, readers, writers come and uh, support us and look at our interesting collection of Short works. That's fabulous. I, you know, I, I come from Minnesota, and every year there's a Fringe Festival. It's at the Guthrie Theater and smaller oh, theaters yes. around. Oh, the, yes. Yes. Yeah. And and so yeah, you get you get to hear the new work by people who are outside of the mainstream. And it's, it's some I of think it is one of our playwrights actually, and I can't remember who, did have a play and uh, at the festival mm -hmm, chosen yeah. for the Fringe right. Festival. Yep. And as you're talking about this, I'm thinking, you know, I mean, when we were younger, uh, there weren't that many films that w that were sort of the dealt with it. well I suppose I'm what I'm saying is actually not true because I'm thinking about on the waterfront um, I was going to say there certainly weren't very many documentary films so maybe they what they did was they dramatized these these really harsh conditions for uh, people to have a window into the struggles that ordinary human beings in the United States at least are, are experiencing the subject matter is is difficult, and I hope sometimes leads to social justice concerns and action on the part of people who, who see this and hear this. So you're writing the play is a very important step in keeping a higher profile on those issues. Coming from the Midwest, I mean, I, the the meth epidemic is huge mm -hmm. that alone, and then the migratory workers and and then the packing plants, meat packing mm -hmm. plants, mm -hmm. and the concentrated animal feed. Lots, mm -hmm. the CAFOs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot about our society that needs improvement, and a lot of volunteer people and artists can help in that regard. I guess I we need to to close down this conversation. It's been wonderful uh, talking with you today. I'm wondering if we could just go back quickly. If you would just give us some final thoughts about uh, how students themselves, college students or younger people, might think about preparing themselves for. 30 or 40 years, maybe even more, after they leave the workforce, and how they might get prepare themselves for an active and fulfilling retirement? I think one good answer to that question is involvement in your community, mm -hmm. because we are all a part of each other. And I think always having a dimension in your life that's focused out some other organization or agency in the community is a, is a real asset for a life. If you build that in as a young person, mm -hmm. then I don't think you ever feel too much alone or isolated. Right. Once you your main livelihood is has ended, I think that helps you to just open your arms to still other, you know, other opportunities. Right. So this has been Middlesex Moments, the radio show brought to you by your local community college right here in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, I would like to invite you all, if you want to learn more about the college itself, to go to our website at mxcc.comnet, that's C-O-M-M-N-E-T, dot E-D-U. 
I'm Anna Wasesha, the president of Middlesex Community College. So happy to be here in Connecticut and meeting all of these phenomenal people who in one way or another have had something to do with this just unforgettable community college right here on the hill in Middletown. I'm wishing you a good day.